This morning, when I was studying, preparing for tonight, I don't know, it was kind of amazing. I had so much I was going to do and so much I was going to say. And there was one thing that just kept coming at me. So we're going to hit that tonight, and then we're going to go home and, and think about it, all right? Uh, I'm going to startle you. This is something that's just going to blow your mind. Today, this day, is National Chocolate Day. Does that get your attention? Go home and eat you some chocolate, and you have my permission. National Chocolate Day, enjoy. But there's something I want to share with you. In John chapter 19, verse 1, there's so many people in our world today. I want to see if I can get you to think about what I really believe God laid on my heart this morning. There's so many in our world today who are so blinded, so blinded by Satan's invitations, so blinded by their hatred for all that is good and right, so blinded by Satan to, to follow after, not just sin in particular, but against every way in the world that can be imagined to stand against God and the things that are of God. I want to show you something right quick like in verse in chapter 19 verse 1 then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him and the Lord and the soldiers planted a crown of thorns put it on his head put on him a purple robe and said hail king of the Jews and they smote him with their hands Pilate went forth again and said to him behold I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold, the man. Now I'm going to stop there tonight because of a lot of things. I want to show you something that just God laid on my heart. I want to see if you can see it and, it and see reflected in the way we're seeing the world today. Pilate, whether he realized it or not, he thought he was in charge. But the whole time, Jesus Christ was in charge every single step of the way. Jesus not only controlled everything that was done, he even controlled everything that was said. While Pilate, if you look at his life tonight, and I don't, you know, I don't usually focus on someone other than the Lord, but I want, to, I want you to see him because he is so much depicted in this story as the problem especially of Americans today, and really worldwide, but in, a, in our America that we live, we have been so spoiled. We have been so used to having things our way. You know, you've heard it all your life, as I have too. You deserve it your way or whatever. Pilate came into this world very poor. He, he was born into a, a little area of the world that was, that was poor, that was, you know, that, that was... He was just born of meager means, but with a huge ambition. He wanted to be all Mr. Powerful. He wanted to be the man, as we see here in verse six, uh, verse 5. Behold the man. That's what uh, Pilate wanted to say about himself. He wanted to stand up there with a crown on his head, and he wanted to be the big, you know, the big leader, the big man. And he wanted to stand there with all the accolades that could be given to a powerful human being. But you know, surrounding him <laughs> right there at that moment was the religious leaders of the day that were in the same shape he was. All of them, and especially Pilate as their leader, was standing there totally in bondage. Slaves, literally. Thinking they were all powerful. Thinking they were the strongest force on earth. And they were standing there completely slave, enslaved by their, their greed, their desire to lift themselves up, by their, their hunger for power. Pilate wanted to be king of the world. The Jewish rabbis, not just the rabbis, but the priests is the word I wanted to use. The priests were standing there, especially if you start with Caiaphas, the head of the, the whole Jewish uh, court, if you want to call it that. They, they were standing there thinking with their robes on, their little bells that tinkled when they walked. 
and their golden laces that sewed their robes together and, and looking so pious and so much like, boy, we've got this thing under control. We've got this one man. Now look at it that way to understand. One man. They took more than 40 troops, more than 40 men, more than 40 soldiers armed as if they were going into the biggest battle of all to take one man. And here stood Pilate looking at them and the, and the, the Jewish priests trying their best to get him to literally perform political murder is what they were after. They wanted him to perform some judicial murder. And so they, they throwed it at him. They thought they were manipulating him. He thought he was manipulating them. They both thought, him and the priest, thought that they were crucifying Jesus, that they were controlling Christ, but yet the only one, the only one in that whole place that was really in control was Jesus. Jesus stood there knowing what he intended to do, knowing exactly what he was doing it for. And as they tried to manipulate how we're going to kill him and what we're going to do to him, Pilate is worst of all. If you can imagine a little, I, I don't know what his body looked like, but let's just say a little wimpy fat boy standing there thinking he is the king of the world, but yet he is so enslaved in bondage to himself and to his desires and what he wanted. He was a representative, obviously, of imperial Rome, the, the powers that controlled all of the known civilized world of the day, the greatest power on earth without question, the greatest political power, military power on earth. He was a representative of them to the Jewish nation. So now to him, success means everything. That's all he's ever wanted, and that's all he wants here when he stands before Jesus in this. He joined as, a, as, as, a, as his little poor background brought him up. He saw the soldiers, and he thought, this is what I want. I want to, I want to be one of those. I want to be honored as one of the greatest of them all. So he joined the Legion of Germanicus, which was, was one of the... One of the really projective groups of soldiers that was thought to be, I remember when I was in the military, they, they said the big red one. Well, that was, that was a, a big deal. Well, you know, the person who wore that big red one on his sleeve, he was, he was a man. That was kind of the way it was as Pilate saw that. That's going to be right where I want to be. He participated in the wars there on the Rhine River, right there where they were so critical. And so then... When he, as, as he grew in the ranks, if you will, sticking his neck into everything and his nose into everybody's business, he rose in the ranks until he got an opportunity to go to Rome. And in Rome, he met some powerful people, and somehow or the other, he was able to marry uh, a woman by the name of Claudia. Claudia was the, was the, son, was the daughter, rather, the youngest daughter of Julia. Julia was the, the daughter of Emperor Augustus. I know you've heard that name. Emperor Augustus was the greatest power on earth in his day. But Augustus' daughter, whom even Augustus himself despised her. He hated her. Literally, he said so. He said, I would rather never had a child at all than to have had something this decrepit. She was mean. I'm talking about to the core. She was mean. Yet you remember when she came out and said, don't have anything to do with this man because I saw him in a dream last night and I know you don't need anything to do with him. Pilate saw that as a great opportunity when he met up with Claudia and he married her. Oh, this is good, man. I'm on my way. And sure enough, sure enough, he not only rose on up in the ranks, but by marrying her, Augustus was able to get him the appointment of the governor to the, uh, the area around uh, uh, the Middle East of, of where Israel was. And so that's how he had risen to the powerful position he was in. But you know, when you look at that powerful position, you think, man, yeah. Yeah, he had, no, he didn't. He was there, standing there as a pawn, both of Satan, obviously, because he was a slave to what Satan had sold to him as a bill of goods that 
where all you need is success and power and wealth and, and all the good things that you can have on this earth. But he was also literally a pawn to God himself and to Jesus Christ, manipulated to do things that he absolutely did not want to do. Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus, especially after his wife had come out and told him, said, you better not have anything to do with this man. He's gonna, he, you're going to be in trouble. It's, he's going to cause you some terrible trouble. But you know what? As Jesus stood and looked at him, I can only imagine. Now, I'm certainly not saying I know God's thinking in any way, shape, or form. I can only imagine the disgust that Jesus must have had in his heart and mind when he looked at this man who thought, thought he had it all on Jesus. He's in control, man. No, he's not. Because even as he tried his best, think about how many times Pilate tried to wiggle out of crucifying Jesus. What all did he do? Well, first of all, you know, he kept questioning these Jews. Well, you, you don't really want to, do you really want to do that? No. They had to have it. It was going to happen. They were determined. I mean, they were rock solid, locked in on what they want. Why? Well, because, not because of them, although they were being used that way, but because of prophecy. God had said through the prophets, this is the way it's going to happen. He tried his best to get him to say, okay, let's just give him a good beat, you know. Let's just scourge him real good. Put him in the hands of those Roman soldiers. Let me tell you something about those guys. They hated the Jews. Not just Jesus. They hated those priests that was screaming out, and those uh, jurists who were crying out for Jesus' blood. They hated them too, but they couldn't, they couldn't do anything to them because they knew if they did... Pilate had have him put to death because he was trying to hold on to power. And so as old Pilate said, okay, here's what I'll do. And so he did. He put Jesus, as the Bible tells us there, into the hands of the soldiers. And you can just hear as the soldiers screamed out and cried for what they wanted to do. Boy, this is their opportunity. Their hatred for the Jews could really come out in force. And so their best trained men at beating folks took up the whips. And they begin to whip Jesus. Now, if you look back, there's a, there's a lot of different uh, writers of that day who wrote much like writers do today in newspapers and so forth, magazines and so forth. But they literally were, were keeping account of history and what history happened outside of the Bible. This is not biblical stuff, but it is historical stuff. And in the writing of the historians of that day, Josephus and others, that wrote of the history of things that was happening at that time. They would write about scourgings. It's what the Bible talks about. They said they scourged him. The Bible said many of those scourgings would end in, in people being dead, which was not supposed to happen. The Roman government had, had said that any scourging should end. The reason they said 39 lashes rather than 40, 40 was supposed to kill them, and 39 would bring them right to the point of death. But they wrote, historians even wrote, of the scourgings of that day where the, the meat would literally, you could see the ribs in a man, the bones sticking out with a chalky white covered with deep red blood. They would even talk about scourgings that would expose the intestines of a man before they quit beating on him, still, still being beaten on as the flesh had so ripped off of his back that you could see his spine and you could see where the ribs attached to the spine. You could imagine how horrible that was. As with every flaying of the, of the whip, meat and blood and flesh came splattering off of the body. They enjoyed that. They took pride in being able to do it just right, where it would hurt the most, but also where it would do the most damage without killing him to a point. That's the kind of thing that happened to Jesus. It wasn't just, I mean, you know, I, I know we see these, these Easter movies and, and they can't show that kind of stuff, not like it really was. Because even if they did their best to, you know, just to, to make it up and make it look that way, only the real thing could really look like it was. That's what Jesus went through. That's how Jesus was treated. To the point to where they finally, they finally took the, 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 red, 
the scepter, the stick, I guess is the best way, the big long stick they call a scepter, that they had put in Jesus' hand when they said he's king of the Jews. They took that from him and beat him in the face until his face didn't even look like him. They said he wouldn't even recognize, Isaiah said he wouldn't recognizable as a man, much less recognizable as the man he was. You think Pilate's in charge? He thinks so. Do you think the, Jew, the, the uh, Roman soldiers are in charge? They think so. Do you think the, the priests are in charge? They think so. But yet if you watch the story, watch it how it goes. Jesus was intent. Jesus was going to the cross. Okay? He was not going to be killed by the whips. He was not going to be killed by some enraged person like Pilate. He was going to the cross because that's what it took to pay for your sin and mine. And as he took all of that beating, and they put that probably, you know, we, we see him as this purple robe, and, you know, that's, I don't know, it's, it's a lot about that that we could talk about, but we won't tonight at the time's sake probably was just an old robe that at one time had been kind of crimson red it kind of turned purple out of out of you know fading and, and overuse but they put this on Jesus and they put that old that old crown of thorns all of that we could go through what all it has semblance of and meaning of because all of it every bit of it even those things that the Roman soldiers they were doing because they were so in charge and so enraged and hated Jesus so bad. Man, we got this. We big, strong men. No, Jesus was totally in charge. Pilate looked at him and said, I'm going to punish him. I'm going to just beat him nearly to death, and then we'll turn him loose. No. No. I'm going to say it like it really is. Jesus wouldn't let him get away with that. This man was so enslaved by his hunger, his desire for success, power, that he knew he had to do what he had to do to hold on to that. Even if it went against everything that he thought, everything that he believed, he wanted, he really, with all of his heart, he wanted to turn Jesus loose. Not because he was a good guy, but because he knew in his heart that what he was doing was totally wrong. But he knew he couldn't let go. He couldn't do what he really wanted to do. He really wanted to turn Jesus loose. But he was a slave. He was a slave to Satan. He was a slave to his own, his own lust for power. He couldn't. He couldn't and still keep his crown, keep his position. Oh, they flogged him. They flogged him until he was nearly about dead. And then they brought him back to Pilate. Pilate said, okay, that's enough. Look at him. Here he is. All right, here's what he says. Behold the man. There he is. Look at him. He's beaten almost to death. He's bleeding from every part of his body. Surely, surely, these people, these religious folks, will turn him loose. Surely. You would think anybody with any compassion in their heart at all would turn him. They couldn't. They couldn't. They were also enslaved to their hatred and their desire to keep their position because they knew, they knew that Jesus ultimately was going to cost them their position as the imperial rulers of the, of, the, of the temple and of the Jewish religious bunch. They were in a charge. So are they still today in Israel, the Orthodox Jews. Still hold the throne, hold the power, but those men didn't realize they were not only enslaved to all of that, they couldn't turn Jesus loose, whether they wanted to or not. Who's in charge? Jesus is. Jesus had to take the beating. Jesus had to go to the cross. There was nothing they could do to stop the train that was already on the track that would lead to your salvation and mine. Jesus was not going to let it jump the track. He took it, he took it, and he took it. And there he stood, silently, without saying a word. As Pilate looked at him and, 
and, and hollered at him, literally hollered at him, tell me, tell me these things, tell me the truth, tell me. And then they looked at Jesus and finally he said, well, just what is truth? He didn't know. He was looking at truth. When he said, behold the man, I guess, I guess that was probably the greatest three words that ever come out of the mouth of Pontius Pilate because they come out of the mouth of so many people today and they are the truth of what everybody, every man, woman, and child that ever reaches the age of accountability, those three words will go with them for all of eternity. Either they will behold him and love him or they will behold him and reject him to their own eternal damnation. Behold. Behold the man. Basically, Pilate is scared to death right now. When he stood there and said that to Jesus, and he was looking face to face with the eternal plan of God, he was terrified. And Satan was playing him like a cheap guitar, but God was using him and his own lust for power that carry out the plan God had had ever since before he even created man. Pilate walked back in his little room, his little area of judgment, and he looked at Jesus and he said, where are you from? Jesus didn't say anything. What are you doing? Jesus didn't say anything. Pilate was so provoked, he said, will you not speak to me? Will you not talk to me? Don't you know that I've got authority to either kill you or authority to release you or crucify you? It's up to me. Talk to me. Jesus stood there until finally Jesus looked him in the face and he said to Pilate through that blood-stained, bludgeoned face that was beaten and unrecognizable, and he said to him, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he that has delivered me over to you has the greater sin. In other words, those priests crying for Jesus' death was the greatest sinners of all. But they were also the greatest prisoners of all. Pilate give up. So I can't do anything else. It's over with. All his life, he had longed for success. All his life, he had longed to be in this spot he was in, holding the authority to life and death. And now, he hated it because he was in a position to where no matter what he felt like he held in authority or position, now it was really a burden. And he began to realize this little small town boy had reached the heights but it wasn't so much fun now. You know, when you look at that story, the death grip of the fantasy of old Pilate is not much different to the fantasy of most people in our country today, around us, in our community, literally in bondage to their lust for power and success and money and goods and things and materialism they literally are you with me they literally cannot in their minds afford to surrender to Jesus is that sad and they wonder why God says you're a slave to sin you're a slave to Satan I'm not a slave to yes you are if you think about it if our minds, Philippians talks about our minds being set on earthly things. If our minds are set on earthly things, then we become a slave to earthly things. Pilate was such a slave, so much in bondage. Romans chapter 6 verse 17 calls it slaves of sin. He was so in slavery to that sin that he could not get free. He tried every way he could. Till finally, what else could he do? He said, go ahead and do what you got to do. Go ahead and do what you got to do. You and I have no idea what that meant. The damnation, the condemnation, 
that it brought on old Pilate's head. But I'm not through. I'll finish with this. So much was Jesus in perfect control, even though, you know, things are many times not what they seem in our world, but Jesus was so in control that at the very instant that Pilate spoke those words, the Bible tells us, was the sixth hour. What is the sixth hour? It was the very moment, the very hour, that the priest would have begun slaughtering the lambs in the temple in preparation for the sacrifices. Who's in charge? Who's running the show? Instead of hollering out this time, behold the man, he said, behold your king. Is that significant? Yeah, it's significant. Because how valid for us as we listen to those words and we say, he will either be our Lord and Savior or he will be our judge and condemnation. Who's in charge? Is Satan in charge? As things look so out of control in America tonight, absolutely not. He's flaying around like a, like a crazed animal. He's flopping around trying to do anything and everything he can, realizing that like a trapped coon, he's under the power. Nothing, nothing he can do, nothing he can do outside of what God will allow. And the wonderful, awesome plan of God is coming to fruition today, just like it was then. Don't you let Satan fool you for a second. <laughs> God's still in charge. Any questions? All right, let's stand. <clears throat> Thank you, God, for our time together. Thank you for the truth that lets us know that, Lord, we only need to focus our minds and our hearts and our desires and our drives on you, on you, Lord. Whether it means sitting in the White House, standing in the pulpit, teaching a Sunday school class, or just giving a neighborhood child, a cup of water, and telling them about Christ. Our responsibility to you, God, is the greatest force on earth. Let us keep that in mind, Lord, as we face all the things we must face. Oh, we may have to do some insignificant suffering compared to what Christ did, but help us to be like him and stay focused on what really is important on who really is in charge and keep our minds and our hearts and our desires on you and you alone because God it's you it's you who will ultimately be the authority that we answer to in Christ's name amen thank you for your patience by the way Sunday morning we'll have something kind of special for you we've got a guy uh, who will be here who's a pastor in, uh, all right, help me out, Uganda, that's it, pastor in Uganda, he's not a missionary from America over there, he is an actual Muslim that was born and raised in Uganda and accepted Christ many years ago, he's been here a couple times before, and the Muslims have come in and burned his orphanage, and he's going to come here to talk to you Sunday morning about how we might can help him out in his quest to try to get it rebuilt, all right? So be in prayer for him. Thank you.